Uh, th thank you very much for the very nice presence we got from Isfahan. Uh, it was a very nice, nice uh, gesture. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been there, but I hope that maybe in the future I will come and visit uh, Isfahan. So. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. So, uh, so far I've been talking mainly about uh, how you compute the for shared distance and also for the clustering it was almost like computing the for shared distance. But I'm, today I'm going to talk about something slightly different. So I'm going to talk about curve simplification or, or trajectory simplification. Uh, I don't know how much you've done. I, do people know, for example, the Douglas Poiker algorithm, how that one works? Yeah? So you have maybe some of you, you've seen... And I think also if there's a lot of data that you usually simplify like this. So this is not only for, uh, for trajectories, but it's, it's used in many, many different areas. Uh, so we have many algorithms that handling movement data, but many of them are, are quite slow. Right? So for example, when we compute this uh, Frechet shared distance, we, the running time is this nm log nm, right? which it's quadratic, which means that it, it is a little bit on the slow side. Uh, if we do want to do some approximate clustering, we, we get close to cubic time, which is, again, very slow. Uh, but the observation here is that many of these trajectories that we see in practice can actually be simplified without losing too much information. Okay? So, just... Uh, so I did examples on trajectories, but I'm going to talk mainly on curves. But say, for example, we have a trajectory, uh, and this is the path of the entity that we're tracking. Then it could look something like this. You're walking along here, and then you speed up at the end. Okay? But here it seems that you, know, you have all these points here, but you... Maybe we can simplify the, tra the trajectory without losing very much information. So we could simplify something like this uh, and this, right? And we wouldn't lose very much information. Uh, another thing that occurs quite often for uh, animal data, for example, is that you track an animal, he's walking around, he or she, and then uh, you know, you're dwelling in the, in the, in the same area. He, and you're not really interested in all these small things. Right? So, uh, how could you simplify this? Well, you could simplify this like this. You come in at this point, and then you leave it at this point. So, you just change the, uh, the times of the, the points. Okay? And we just, uh, uh, several years ago, we did just. We just checked how much you can, what, what, are, what a typical data set, uh, if you simplify it, how much can you actually save. Uh, so we just generated some artificial trajectories in a universe of 400 or 400, we had 10,000 points, and say that you uh, allow an error of five units, well, then you can actually get it down to ridiculous small numbers, some of these. Uh, here's a car trajectory with 85,000 points, and we could... Uh, get down the number of points to roughly 2,600 points, which is, again, ridiculously small. Right? Uh, so if we can do our, all our computation on these uh, simplified trajectories instead of the original trajectories, that's another way to speed up our algorithms. Right? We will get a small error, but maybe that error is okay. Okay, so... I'm going to talk about four algorithms today. So I'm going to talk about uh, the famous Douglas Poiker algorithm, which I found out when I was looking it up, that it was actually also invented by someone called Rama. So I would call it the Rama Douglas Poiker algorithm. Uh, and then uh, there is a very simple uh, simplification algorithm that I'm, I'm sure has been uh, used many times before, but it was highlighted in the literature, in the, in the computation movement analysis literature, uh, as late as 2010. Uh, then there's uh, the famous Imairi uh, algorithm, and then I will uh, talk about the Agaval, Harpeled, Mustafa, and Wang uh, algorithm. Okay, so let's start with something very simple. The Ramo-Douglas-Poiker algorithm. 
So I think this is the most successful uh, simplification algorithm used in practice. Uh, it's, I've seen it used in GIS, uh, geography, computer vision, pattern recognition, and, and in computational geometry. It's used in a huge number of uh, applications. And it's, it, it's very easy to implement. And it works, again, very well in practice, even though the running time, the worst case running time, is, uh, is quite bad. Okay. So this is the, the algorithm in pseudocode. So as you see, it's, it's quite simple. As input, we get a polygonal path uh, with endpoints. And we get a, a threshold epsilon. This is the simplification error that we're going to allow. So then we uh, initialize, initialize i to be 1 and j to be n. So that's the shortcut that we're going to study. Okay. So all these simplification algorithms actually use the, the original vertex set as uh, the possible vertices for the simplified uh, path. Okay. So then we say, okay, find a vertex VF between PI and PJ that is farthest from PI, PJ. Okay. So we look at the segment PI, PJ, and then we find a point that is furthest away from PI, PJ. So in this case, this would be uh, the point VF. Right? It's just the Euclidean distance. Okay, so if distance is greater than epsilon... Well, then we're not happy with the simplification. So we split there, and we recursively look for a simplification of the two subpaths. And otherwise, we just output vi, vj as our uh, simplification. Okay. So what is the error here? Is the error the Frechet distance? Hausdorff distance, exactly. It's, because it's just the, the maximum distance between a point and a segment. So it's not the Frechet distance, right? Because the path could go back and forth here, and it could have a very large uh, Frechet distance. But this is a simplification with respect to the Hausdorff distance. So the algorithm works as follows. Here is the input path. And now we start by uh, looking at the shortcut. Starting at P1 and ending at Pn. So starting at P and ending at Q. Okay, so we check, is this a good shortcut or not? Well, we just find the point, some point that is further than epsilon. Right? We don't even have to find the furthest point, just some point that is f uh, further than epsilon away. Okay, we split, and then we continue recursively. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Actually, it's, it's my animation is wrong here. Yeah. So you should actually always take the one that is furthest away. So I'm sorry about that. So uh, did I go the wrong way? Because in the algorithm you also uh, yeah. So uh, it's the one that is furthest from uh, PIPJ. Uh, so assume that this one is the farthest one. It's just the distortion in the space here. Uh, so I split it, and then I continue. I split, and again the distance is greater than epsilon, and I continue recursively. Okay, here is uh, greater than epsilon, I continue, and I just continue like this until all the shortcuts has house of distance uh, smaller than epsilon. Okay. I guess the, the algorithm is clear, right? Good. So this is then my simplification algorithm, the, the output of my simplification algorithm. Okay, so what's the uh, running time of this algorithm? What's the worst case running time? Hmm? Yes, but how bad is it? Huh? Yeah, n square. Why is it n square? Exactly, right? The recursion, I mean, if we always split evenly, 
then the recursion, the, the algorithm will run in n log n time. But in worst case, it could be that we split it uh, so that we only get one point on one side and the rest of the curve on the other side. Right? So then we only, we only reduce the problem with one vertex. So then we have almost the same problem again, and we just have to go through all of them. So that, that results in, in a quadratic running time. However, in, in uh, most practical cases, the split will be fairly even. Right? Uh, so then, say you, you do a split. Well, if the split is somewhere close to the middle, or let's say it this way, if this cut is not too close to the endpoints, then we will get an even split and, we, and the running time is n log n time. Right? But again, the worst case is n square. Uh, there is a very nice result by Hirschberger and Snoying from 98 that says that if the curves are in 2D and they do not self-intersect, then you can actually do it in n log star n, which is quite impressive, I think. Okay. So, okay, so this works very well in practice. However, we do not have any bound on the complexity of the simplification. Right? It could be that the output is almost as bad as, as almost as big as the input. Right? We cannot really bound how good it is. So let's look at another uh, approach. Okay, this is uh, by DreamLL, but it's, it's so simple, I, and I'm sure I've seen it before, but, but the analysis is uh, kind of interesting, I think. So this algorithm is even simpler, if possible. So you say, okay, I take uh, my first point, and then I just merge everything that is inside a ball of radius epsilon. Right. So I just say, okay, I go here. Now I start to walk along my path. I find the first vertex, if it's inside uh, my, uh, the ball, sorry, I go to the first vertex. If that one is connected to something else inside, then I just merge it. So I, more or less I just remove it, right? So what I will do here is remove everything that is inside into one single ball, okay? Then I go to the next, next point and do exactly the same. Okay? Very simple. Good. So, uh, I call this a simple simplification. Uh, so, they have some very nice properties. The first property is that every edge uh, has length at least epsilon. Right? Because you always have to go, if I, if I accept the last one, so you start and then you compress everything that is inside the ball. So the next point I'm going to go to will be at lowest epsilon away. Uh, so so now... Yeah, I only look uh, okay. uh, following the path. Yeah, so if it goes out once, uh, then I, I simplify that. And then if it comes back, then I will look at them when I get to that place. So now I'm wondering if I did the analysis later on in this, in this slides correctly, but we'll see. Uh, it might be an exciting talk. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. The second uh, property is that the Frechet distance between uh, the original curve and the simplification is smaller than or equal to epsilon. Uh, and this is quite easy to see. Is there anyone who can see why this is? Yeah, exactly, right? I can take, oops.
So, uh, so this is what I have. I, I take all the red, uh, all the red points here, and I more or less map it to this point. Right? So that means this entire path will be within epsilon from this point. Right, so I map all of them, and then I just walk more or less over to the next side. And the dist shared distance for this will be at most epsilon. Right. Okay, so I haven't talked about C packness very much, but I think it's a quite a nice uh, uh, measurement for curves. So a curve P is C packed. Uh, if it has finite length, and for any ball, so any ball, so I mean uh, the center could be anywhere, and for any radius, it holds that the intersection between the, the curve and the ball is at most some constant C times the radius of that ball. Okay? So that just means that you cannot have too much of the curve inside uh, the, uh, any ball. Uh, okay, so the properties uh, that uh, Driemelal proved is that if, if the path is C-packed, then the simplification will be 6C-packed. So you maintain this uh, uh, sparseness of the trajectory, of the curve. Okay? Oh, it changed the fonts, but that's... So this should be the... Oops. Yes? Stay there. Okay, so let P be a curve and let... Um, so I need an observation before I start to prove the, the, uh, the main results. So I want to prove that if P is C-packed, then the simplification is 6C-packed. But I will need an observation before I prove that. So the observation says, say that I have a curve and I have an epsilon simplification, P prime. Okay? Then the, the, the length of the original curve inside a ball of radius r plus epsilon is smaller than um, Is that true? I guess I actually changed the inequality, right? I mean, if I make the ball bigger it's highly unlikely that the length of the path will be smaller, right? So I guess this should actually be greater than. So if I take the intersection between P and a ball of radius R plus epsilon, then this, this length has to be greater than or equal to if I look at the, the length of the simplification in a smaller ball. Okay? And this smaller ball is, uh, has radius R. And epsilon is, of course, the, sim the, epsilon, the uh, simplification uh, parameter. So, okay, so I, I uh, look at the ball, uh, BPR, so it's centered at P and has radius R. Okay. And now I look at any segment, U, that intersects this ball. Okay, and then I look at uh, the original curve between the two endpoints. So the original curve, uh, well, before the simplification. And now I, so, so actually it's, it's not as trivial as I would think to prove this. So, uh, because I first thought that this should be a trivial statement to prove. But I, I so I tried to simplify this proof, but it, actually I couldn't, so... Uh, I'll, I'll give you the, this fairly complicated proof. Uh, so look now at the uh, hippodrome H of uh, U. So the hippodrome has, means that it's the union of all points that lie within epsilon of U. Okay? So what do we have? Well, we have that the path must lie inside, the original path has to lie inside the hippodrome. And that's because we know that this part of the path, 
must lie within epsilon of, of uh, this endpoint. And since this endpoint and this endpoint uh, lie inside the hippodrome, the whole path must lie inside the hippodrome. Okay? Uh, so now I take uh, two vertical uh, lines that go through the endpoints of uh, the intersection between uh, U, so my simplification, and my original ball uh, centered at P and radius R. Okay, obviously the intersection between the ball and U is equal to the length of this B. Okay. And also I know that if I look at the original curve, it has to intersect both the left bound and the right bound. So that means that if I take a uh, look at the intersection between the original curve, PU, and the hippodrome, well, that has to be greater than V, greater than or equal to V, right? Because I'm just taking a slab, and I say inside this slab it has to be greater than V. But of course that means that it has to be greater than V in the whole hippodrome. Okay. <clears throat> So V lies inside uh, the ball centered at P and radius R. Now look at the hippodrome of V. So again, the union of all points that lie within epsilon of V. Okay. And now I look at the bigger ball. Right. So what do I know about the bigger ball? Well, the bigger ball has to include the hippodrome. Because it's increased, the, the diameter of the new ball is R plus epsilon. Right? And the hippodrome is a union of all points that lie within epsilon of V. Which means that this ball has to include the whole hippodrome. Is that clear or you can just trust me on this? Okay. Now, that, Im that implies that if I take the, the intersection, the, the amount of the path of PU inside this hippodrome, right, it has to lie in the bigger ball. Right? I mean, because it has to lie in the hippodrome, and the hippodrome is a subset of the bigger ball, of course, the path of the path also has to lie in the, in the bigger ball. Right? But that implies that if I take uh, uh, the intersection or the path, part of the path inside the bigger ball, it has to be greater than or equal to B. Right? So that means this is equal to V and this is greater than or, or equal to V, which means that this has to be greater or equal to this. Right. So I'm just saying, if I expand the ball, uh, then I will still have quite a lot of uh, length of the path inside uh, the, uh, f from the simplification inside the bigger ball. Okay. Good. Yeah. No, you can't because um, no, because I mean the the original path. Uh, no, I can't because then I can't. Buy, uh, I mean, then I can't say anything about this the the green path. Right, the green path could be outside this ball. Right? But now when I guarantee that it's bigger, I guarantee that there is some part of the original path that must be in the bigger ball. Right? Good. So now we get back to the original problem. If P is C-packed, then I want to prove that the simplification is 6C-packed. And I have this observation, and I still have the wrong in inequality. But Okay, so uh, I'm going to do the proof by contradiction. So I'm going to assume uh, that 
for some ball, there exists some ball, such that when I do the simplification, the amount of the simplification inside that ball is bigger than uh, 6CR. Right? If I can prove this, then of course it's not 6C packed. And I will have two cases. I will have the case when R is bigger than epsilon, bigger than or equal to epsilon, uh, and the case when R is smaller than epsilon. Okay. So let's look at uh, the case when R is bigger than epsilon. And now I'm going to... Uh, so I already fixed my ball, and I'm going to grow it. Right? So I make it twice as big. Okay. Now, since epsilon is smaller than or equal to R, I know that this amount, so the amount of the path within the ball with radius 2R, has to be greater than or equal to the uh, ball of radius R plus epsilon. Right? That's obvious. Uh, from this, I know that this has to be bigger than or equal to the uh, amount of the simplification inside the smaller ball, BPR. Right? This follows directly from the observation I just proved. Okay? But this is greater than 6CR, according to uh, the assumption. Right? So what does this imply? Well, this implies that the intersection between P and a ball of radius 2R has to be greater than 6CR. Right? But that implies... What? But that implies... So this should be... Uh, uh, this implies that if I set R prime to be 2R, then the amount of the path inside this ball is greater than 3CR. Which means that it's not C packed. Right? So the original curve cannot be C packed if this is true. And that's a contradiction, and we are done. So, again, if the, the original path is C packed, then the simplification will be 6 C packed, which is very useful uh, if you assume that you have some kind of sparseness property on the, the path. And I should say also, Dream and Lyle, they, sh they show this very nice result saying that if the path is 6 C packed, uh, if, if two paths are 6 C packed, then you can compute the Fréchet distance at a 1 plus epsilon approximation of the Fréchet distance in n log n time. Right? Which is a very nice result. Yep? Uh, can you? It would be a very short talk. Uh, can you? Uh, so let's see. Uh, Yeah, so you just put in uh, so you just put in something smaller here. Instead of two R, you put in uh, something smaller, and then maybe you could even. So the proof is not. I think the proof is done to make it as simple as possible. Uh, so there are a couple of more arguments for this. Oops. But it could be that you can actually improve it by just plugging in uh, other values here. But then you probably will have more cases, I guess. That's my guess. So you would have to do, because here you get 2R, and that's... Uh, huh? Right, because here you, you have to start with 2R. Because you're assuming that R is greater than or equal to epsilon. So I guess then you would actually have to be do a more, include more cases, and then maybe you could improve it. I don't know.
Ah, okay. No, no. You're right. This could probably be improved. But then there's a, a second part here. There's a second case, which I don't uh, talk about. But there, it's tight. So you get the tightness on the second case. Yep. Okay. So to summarize uh, the result by DreamLL is they can do the simplification in linear time. Uh, the nice, they have some very nice properties. One is that all the edges, except the last one, has length epsilon. Uh, the Fourier distance between uh, the original curve and the simplification is at most epsilon. And the simplification is still uh, 6C packed. Well, going from C packed to 6C packed. Okay, so both these algorithms are very simple and fast, but they do not give a bound on the output. Right? Also, the previous one, you, it might be that you don't, so, you don't save anything, right? If all the edges are already bigger than epsilon, there's nothing you can do, right? So, uh, in my year in 1988, they gave an algorithm that produces an epsilon simplification with a minimum number of links. So it actually gives you an optimal solution. Okay? Uh, so, the idea is very simple. You take the input uh, path and your threshold epsilon, and then you build a graph of all valid shortcuts. Right? Uh, and then in this graph, you just compute the minimum link path, the path with the minimum links. Okay? So it seems obvious that this works, right? So you look, compute the all valid shortcuts, and then you just do a shortest path query in this graph. And each edge will cost you one. Yeah? Is that clear? Uh, what's, what's the value so if the distance between uh, the shortcut and the uh, original path is at most epsilon. Good. So here again we use the Hausdorff distance. So it's just the, part, the, 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 <laughs> the vertex furthest away from the edge. Okay. Good. So we just check every edge. Is uh, are all the vertices between? You get a <laughs> here without doing anything. Uh, then uh, so here the epsilon is bigger than uh, <laughs> the area is bigger than. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I think the algorithm is clear, right? No? Okay, good. So at the end, this is the, all the valid edges, all the valid shortcuts. Okay, then we make a directed graph of all the edges. So we always go from behind and to the front. Right? You, cannot, you cannot really go backwards. Actually, you wouldn't even gain anything from that. And then you just compute the minimum link path. Right? This will be the simplification with the smallest number of edges. So what is the running time of this? Uh, how much time does it cost to compute, decide if a shortcut is uh, valid or not? Hmm? N. N, yeah. You check all the points in between, and if the distance is uh, one of them is greater than epsilon, then it's not valid, otherwise it's valid. So, and how many edges do we have? Well, we have N square. So, we have N square possible shortcuts, uh, linear time per shortcut, so that means it will cost us cubic time to build the graph. And then we do a breadth first search or any, something like that on the graph, which will take uh, a quadratic time, so linear in the size of the graph. So the total running time is cubic. Right? So, and the nice thing is that we will get a path with the minimum number of edges. But the bad thing is, of course, that cubic time to simplify a graph, uh, path is just way too much. 
Uh, Chan and Chin Chan and Chin show that you can actually improve the running time to uh, n square. This, this is far from trivial. Uh, it's actually very nice, uh, quite a nice uh, algorithm. Thank you. Oh, now it works. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, okay, so, the, so what we have so far is that the Rama Douglas Poiker algorithm runs in worst case quadratic time. It's very fast, it's very simple, uh, and it, so it, it's fast in practice, not in theory. Uh, and but it outputs a path with no bound on the, on the path. Yeah. And this uses the Hausdorff distance. The simple uh, simplification by Dremelal uh, is extremely fast. It has uh, linear uh, running time. Uh, again, there is no bound on the size of the path. Okay. Uh, this uses the Fréchet distance. Uh, for the error measure. In my IRI, uh, the uh, quadratic time is uh, simplification. It's fairly complicated, but it will give you the uh, simplification with the minimum number of edges. Ah, yes, yes, you, you're right. The improvement is done by Chin and Chan. Uh, okay. So again, the first, this one and the top one use the Hausdorff distance, and the middle one used the Fréchet distance. So can we get something that is simple, fast, and has worst case uh, bound using, so worst case bound on the complexity of the simplification using the Fréchet error measure? And this is what I'm going to do uh, next. So Agarval, Harpeler, Mustafa, and Wang, they showed an algorithm that has n log n running time. So again, it's very fast. The error measure is using the Fréchet distance. And the path that you output put has at most the same complexity as a minimum linked epsilon divided by 2 simplification. Right? So is that good? Yeah. Is it always good? So unfortunately, it is not always good, right? Because it could be that an epsilon divided by two simplification, so say I have an optimal epsilon divided by two simplification, it could still have very high complexity. But then when I say, well, I'm actually going to allow an epsilon simplification, it could be that this, the, op, the size of the optimal epsilon uh, simplification is much, much, much smaller, right? I mean, it could even be that, uh, you know, for epsilon divided by two, you have almost a whole path, but for epsilon, you could have only one single edge. But this is the only bound we have, so uh, I, I'm going to show the, the proof anyway. Okay, so this is a, a little bit tricky, but uh, I think it's quite a nice uh, argument, and it shows how you use Fréchet distance to, uh, when, you, when you use the Fréchet distance in the proofs. So, I'm giving a polygonal curve with uh, n points, and I will denote by delta pi pj the Fréchet distance between the edge between pi and pj and the subpath. So I will denote by p, uh, pi of pi and pj the subpath of the or input path between pi and pj. Uh, okay, so the Fréchet distance. When I say delta of pi pj, it's just the shared distance between this segment and this path. Okay, and the algorithm is as follows. Uh, you just uh, start at, at the 
original uh, start point. And then you just find one possible short shortcut. Right? I don't care which one it is. I just pick any that I can find. Right? So I pick this shortcut, and the only requirement I have is that the shortcut has to have smaller uh, than epsilon for shared distance to the original curve. Okay? And then if I extend it with one, then the for shared distance has to be greater than epsilon. Okay? But just give me any edge like that, and I'm happy. Okay? Is the algorithm clear? I just start at a point, I just find a shortcut that is smaller than epsilon, and if I go one step further, it will be bigger than epsilon. That's the only requirement I have. And I just continue like this until I reach the end of the path. Okay? So here again, I find my shortcut, and if I go, this shortcut has for shared distance at most epsilon. If I go one step further, I will have a for shared distance greater than epsilon. So also recall that uh, I can compute the for shared distance between PI and PJ and the path between PI and PJ in linear time. Right? Because that's just uh, the free space diagram with height 1, because that's the segment PI, PJ. And the horizontal axis is just the, seg the number of segments between PI and PJ. Okay. So now the only thing I want to do is find the first J. Well, I don't want to find the first J. I want to find some. Well, okay. If I want to find the first J, right, such that the Frechet is this smaller than or equal to epsilon, and if I go one step further, it's bigger, I might have to spend quadratic time. Right? Because first I have to look at the uh, path of length one, then the path of length two, path of length three, and so on. And if the length of the shortcut is n, that means that I will have to spend quadratic time just to find the first uh, shortcut. So I want to avoid this in some way. And the nice thing with the algorithm, it says I don't have to find the first shortcut. I can just find any shortcut that is valid. Okay? So how can we speed up the search for PJ? So again, we're not, we don't want to find, we don't need to find the first one. We just want to find any. Uh, okay. So this, the idea here is that we search for PJ using first exponential search and then uh, binary search. So we look at number, the first one, then the second one, then the fourth one, eighth one, sixteenth, and so on. And when I think I uh, searched enough, I will do binary search in that interval. So how will that look like? Okay, so I do my exponential search. Uh, and I know if I stand, the point I stand at, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the point I stand at, it will have a direct connection to the next point. So that means that if I take a shortcut to the next point, the Fréchet distance is zero. Right? So I will always know that I have one point where the Fréchet distance is smaller than epsilon. Right. So now, I w the only thing I want to find now is a point where the Fréchet distance is bigger than epsilon. Okay. So I just start to do uh, exponential search until I find a point where the shortcut has smaller, has greater Fréchet distance than epsilon. Okay. So what can happen? Well, maybe I don't find any. So maybe I'll reach the end of the path. But then I know that that shortcut has for shared distance smaller than epsilon, and I'm done. Right? So I need to. So, uh, but say that I don't need uh, reach the end. Well, then I find a point where the for shared distance uh, to the shortcut is bigger than epsilon. So let's see. I'm here. So this is in my exponential search. Uh, this one, uh, the Fréchet distance to, for this shortcut is smaller than epsilon. And then at some point I find something that is bigger than epsilon. So now I do a binary search in this area. So I look at something in the middle. 
and I perform my, I compute the Fréchet distance for this shortcut. And if the shortcut is smaller than epsilon, then I go to the right. And notice now that the invariant is still correct, right? Here I have a point that is smaller, where the Fréchet distance is smaller than epsilon, and here I have a point where the Fréchet distance is bigger than epsilon. So that means that there must be two incident vertices here, where one is smaller than epsilon and one is bigger than epsilon. Right? So if epsilon, if the Fréchet distance is smaller than epsilon, then we search right, and if it's bigger than epsilon, then we search left. So again, at some point, I need to find, I will find two points, pj, so that the Fréchet distance to, uh, for the shortcut to pj is smaller than a equal to epsilon. And the next point has to have a Fréchet distance that is bigger than epsilon. Right? Is that clear? Yeah? Good. So the running time of this is log n, right? Because I only perform log n uh, queries with this exponential and binary search. And each query will cost me linear time. Uh, why are you changing this uh, Why not? Oops, sorry. Ah, uh, ah, uh. ah. <laughs> yes. There might, there might be a point after pi that uh, that pi two pi k, for example, uh, has the virtual distance bigger than epsilon, but. Uh, so let's say that again. So this PI is where I start, yeah. and now you're saying. There is a PK in the PJ is bigger than PK. PJ is bigger than PK. Yeah. I mean the index of J, J is bigger than PK. Yeah. And here you're saying this shortcut is bigger than epsilon, or? Bigger than epsilon. So here, this one is uh, smaller than epsilon, right? No, P I P K is bigger than epsilon. P I P J is less than epsilon. Yes. So, if such a case happens, then well, so you want me to find PJ. Yeah. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm saying that there has to be a PJ in between here. Because here, the Fréchet distance is smaller than or equal to epsilon. Yeah. Here, the Fréchet distance is bigger than epsilon. Yeah. So some point, somewhere in here, there must be two points where this is smaller than epsilon yeah. and this is bigger than epsilon. So now I'm just saying pick this as my PJ. Okay, good. Okay, so we can compute this in n log n time. So now we just crap. So now we just have to prove that uh, we have to prove a bound on the output, on the size of the output. And to do that, I'm going to first need a, a technical lemma. So it's, it's, it's actually an uh, observation. I think it can be used uh, quite generally. So it says, let's say I have a, a, a path, a curve, and then I look at four indices. So I look at L, which is the smallest index. So I have PL, and I look at M, which is the largest index. OK. And then I take any two points in on this curve, i and j. And the lemma says that the Fréchet distance between the shortcut of pi and pj to the path is at most twice the Fréchet distance uh, of the shortcut pl to pm. 
So if I take a shortcut inside uh, a, a path that I know have bounded for shared distance, then I know that that will also have bounded for shared distance. So let's look at this. So fix a matching that realizes the, this for shared distance between PL and PM. Right? So let's say that this is lambda. So that means from PL to PM to the path, there is a matching that realizes this uh, distance. Okay. And now I uh, look at the matching and I say, let QI be the point on PLPM that is matched to PI. And let QJ be the point uh, along this uh, segment that is matched to PJ in this realization. Okay. So that means I know that the Fréché distance uh, between this path and this is at most lambda. Right? Because it's a realization of exactly that uh, Fréché distance. Right? Then I say, well, look at the Fréché distance between QI, QJ. And uh, so this is just a segment and the segment PI, PJ. What is that? So why is it bounded by lambda? Anyone? Well, what do I know? What do I know about the distance between QJ and PJ? Sorry? If there is a pass between PI and PL. PI and PL, yeah. So uh, the first distance must uh, be bigger. Must, uh, if, uh, uh, no, I don't think that's ne necessary. But here I only want to know the Fréché distance between this segment and this segment. So let's see. What's, if there's something that can help us. So what is the distance between QJ and PJ? Less than or equal to lambda, right? Because we know there's a realization that gives you lambda. And what is the distance between QI and PI? Less than lambda, right? So we have two segments whose endpoints are at most lambda from each other. So what does that mean about the Fréché distance? It has to be smaller than lambda, smaller than or equal to lambda. So we know that the Fréché distance between the two segments is smaller than lambda. So now we can just put this together. So what we want to bound is the Fréché distance between the path between PI and PJ and the shortcut PI, PJ. Right? Well, now we can just use the triangle inequality because we know that the, dis the Fréché distance between the path PI, PJ to QI, QJ is at most lambda. And we know that the Fréché distance between QI and QJ, QI, QJ, to PI, PJ, is at most lambda. Right? And since this is, uh, follows the triangle inequality, that means that the Fréché distance between the curve and PI, PJ is at most 2 lambda. Right? Good. Okay, so that's uh, the lemma we're going to use. So now it gets back to the uh, original uh, theorem. So it says that the, that the simplification is, uh, has Fréché distance at most epsilon. And I'm claiming that the bound on the number of vertices or number of edges is bounded by the same number of points in an optimal solution using an error of measure of eps error of epsilon divided by 2. So, I mean, the, the, the fact that it has Fréché distance at most epsilon is, comes immediately from the construction, right? Because we don't add any edges that have larger uh, Fréché distance. So let's skip that and just focus on uh, bounding the complexity of the path. Okay, so I will say, okay, I have uh, 
an optimal uh, epsilon divided by 2 simplification. And I denote that by Q. And the points in Q is denoted PJ1, PJ2, PJ3, up to PJL. And then I have our simplification that we computed from our algorithm. And I call that P prime, and that's PI1, PI2, up to PIK. So the only thing I want to prove by induction is that I always go further along the path on P prime. Right? So I want to say, if I look at the mth point in P prime, I will be further along the curve than if I would take the mth point in Q. If I, can, if, the, if I can always guarantee that, then I know that I have uh, fewer edges, fewer or at most the same number of edges as an optimal simplification using epsilon divided by 2. Is that clear how that the, the, the argument for that? Yeah. So let's prove it. Okay, so this is what we have, right? We have, uh, we want to prove that PJ that JM, PJM comes before PIM. Okay. So the induction hypothesis says that let's assume that PJM minus 1 comes before, or at least not later than PIM minus 1. Right? So we assume that it's true. And now we want to prove it for uh, the mth point along the simplifications. Okay. So we have, this is what we want to prove, and let PI prime just be uh, the next point after PIM. Okay. So that means that the optimal simplification took a shortcut to PJM, while we will uh, want to prove that we actually will go to PIM, and PIM is again further along the path. So by construction, we have that uh, the Frechet distance between the shortcut PIM minus 1 to PI prime has to be greater than epsilon. Right? That's, that's our algorithm. Because we know that this is a valid shortcut, so this, the next one cannot be a valid shortcut. And we know that the distance between PI, uh, the, the uh, Frechet distance between uh, this edge and the path has to be smaller than or equal to epsilon. That's what we know from the algorithm. So the only thing we need to prove is that if I prime, I prime is bigger than JM, then we're done. Okay. Good. Okay, so this is what we had. So assume the opposite. So assume that I prime is smaller than or equal to JM. So we have JM here, PJM here, and then we have PI prime uh, earlier along the curve. Well, we know that Q is an epsilon divided by 2 simplification. So that means that we know that the shortcut between JM minus 1 to JM is at most epsilon divided by 2. Right? Because this is an optimal, optimal epsilon divided by 2 simplification, every shortcut has to have at most for shade distance epsilon divided by 2. So how can we use this? Well, if we know that this shortcut has for shade distance epsilon divided by 2, what do we know about this shortcut? Or what do we know about this shortcut? It has to be less than epsilon, right? So according to lemma 1, if I take any two points between uh, JM minus 1 and JM, then the Frechet distance for that shortcut can be at most twice as much as the Frechet distance between uh, m minus 1 and m. So it can be at most epsilon. Right? But that's a contradiction because then PI, the shortcut to pi prime cannot have a Frechet distance that is greater than epsilon. Right? So we have a contradiction. So this is a contradiction because... Uh, this should be greater than epsilon by construction. So I prime has to be bigger than JM. And we're done. Right? So our algorithm would always go further than an optimal epsilon divided by 2 simplification. And that gives us our, our bound. 
Good. So given a polygonal curve, uh, so this works in any dimension. And a parameter epsilon, an epsilon simplification of P of size at most, the optimal uh, epsilon divided by 2 simplification can be constructed in n log n time using n space. So to summarize what we've done so far, uh, so the Ramo Douglas Poiker again is very fast. Uh, it uses Hausdorff error. The simple simplification has, is again very fast. It has some very nice properties. It uses the Frechet error. Imai uh, Shin Chan gives an optimal solution, but is slow. Uh, and Agol Hapaled Mustafa and Wang is fast and easy to implement, and it actually gives us some kind of bound on the output. So I'm not saying it's a good bound, but at least it's a bound. Okay, so I'm just very, very briefly going to touch about uh, how you can handle time. Uh, so this is mainly uh, an approach that you use in data mining and databases, but I think I, I just wanted to, to mention it anyway. Okay, so... Uh, so I'm not working on databases, so I, I'm going to say this without any kind of... Uh, uh, assurance at all. So uh, it is claimed that there are five standard database operations done on, on trajectories. So it's where at, so what is the location of the entity at time t? Uh, it's when at, so what is the time at which e is within distance of a point? Right, so I more or less I perform a point query and I want to know when the entity uh, is close to that point. Okay? And then I intersect nearest neighbor and spatial join, but I, I'm not going to talk about them because they, they uh, are maintained uh, easily after the simplification. So I'm only, only going to talk about where at and when at. So where at, uh, so you, you want to have the location of E at time T. Okay, so maybe that is your simplification, and then you state your time t, and you want the position of the entity at that time. So this is not too hard to, to get correct when you do the simplification. Uh, the other one, when at, so you, have, you want to have the time at which e is within distance l of your uh, query point. So maybe you have a query x, y, and you want to know when your entity is close to that point. Okay? So, we want to define a distance between the simplification and the original trajectory. And we say that the distance function is sound for any query Q if for each epsilon greater than zero, so that's the simplification, there exists a delta greater than zero such that for every trajectory T, and its epsilon simplification t prime, we have that the distance between the query on the original path is close to the query on the simplified path. Right? So it just says that we want a small error. <coughs> and this was, uh, this was argued by Carl Wolfson and, and Tysevsky. So just to show you maybe what the problem could be. So say I just use a standard curve simplification algorithm. And these are the time uh, points of uh, time stamps of my uh, coordinates. Well, so maybe I would just simplify it like this. And then when I perform a query when at, what I get is when at time six. Well, using this simplification, I will end up very close to this point but actually uh, I should have reported this point, or at least something close to this point. Uh, so what we want to do is be a little bit more careful when we do the simplification, so that we, in this case, would include maybe uh, the point at time six in the simplification. So we will get a fair, a, a, the simplification will be a little bit bigger but uh, hopefully it will have a, a, some nice properties. 
So there is a very si simple uh, trick to use in, in the data mining community. We just says you look at all the speeds of the paths, and now you just scale the time axis with a factor of the maximum speed. So what does this actually imply? Well, it implies that if I look at my trajectory in three-dimensional space, all my edges will be fairly steep. Right? There will be no edges that will be almost horizontal. Right? They will actually all be at least 45 degrees uh, towards the, the z-axis. Right? Now, if, if you guarantee that, then there is a theorem by, by uh, these guys that show that where are at spatial joint nearest neighbor and intersect are sound. So they, they work pretty well. However, when at is not sound. Uh, so then it becomes a little bit tricky. How would you actually, and you can actually show that this, you cannot really do much about this. So the only thing you can do that we've been able to, to show is that you can change the property a bit. Right? So we can say, okay, here we have the approximate when at, when is, are we within distance L from X, Y? And I can allow some approximation. And then I say, let's look at the set, all the set of points along the path that uh, when the points are within distance L from X, Y. Right? This means might be completely different from the original uh, curve. Okay. So then the result says that if I'm given a query point for, for when at, and let T1 be the time reported by, by our approximate when at. Right? So I walk along my simplification, and at some point I'm close to my query point. Actually, I have to be closer than epsilon plus alpha, where alpha is the maximum speed. Mm, no, this should be... Okay. Uh, then there will exist some point on the original curve that will be close by. So there exists a time point T2 in this set of everything that lies close by within distance epsilon plus 2 alpha such that the time between these are epsilon divided by alpha. So it more or less says that, okay, maybe I don't get the... Uh, anything that is actually close to what I wanted. But if I report some point, then I know that the original curve uh, will be close by. Do you remember the number of the slide? Uh, go to slide. Yes. And, but now the, the larger this maximum speed, the better the bound is that you get on this. Yeah, but this grows, right? The area grows. So I grow the area. So I, so I get a bigger spatial error, but I get a smaller temporal error. Uh, okay. So this is what I've gone through so far for uh, simplification algorithms. And also just a little bit a small trick how, how you can handle time. And because uh, Mark is here, I had to add a reference to his work. <laughs> so this is, uh, but it's, it's kind of, uh, I mean, it is nice still. 
<laughs> so it's, it's uh, how you handle streaming data, how you simplify curve using uh, when the data is streaming. So uh, it's a different model, but I think uh, in many situations this could actually be applicable. Okay. Yeah, so yes, let, uh, let's do one more thing, which is a, just an application of what I did uh, in the previous, uh, in the first lecture. Because I, I think this is a kind of a, a nice little observation. So uh, recall the free space diagram. So we compute the free space, space diagram to compute the Fourier distance between two curves. And if uh, we build a free space diagram, and then if there is a xy monotone path between x and y, then the free space, free space distance is at most r. Right? So we take PQ, that's response to a, a point in the white space if the distance between P and Q is less than r. Uh, so now I'm going to look at something I call the constraint for uh, a free space diagram. And there are a lot of different examples. I'm just going to show you one example. So it's an example of saying that this free space diagram can be used for many different settings. It does not have to be used only for the Fréché distance, or the, for only for, the, for when we use the Euclidean distance between the, the two points. So recall, so what, what is a, a point in white space? Well, a point in white space it corresponds to two points, one on the vertical line and one on the horizontal line. And for those two points, I'm asking a query that I want a yes or no to. Right? So for our Fréché distance, I said, is the distance between P and Q at most R? But this is just a decision, right? It's just, it's just a yes or no. I could put in anything here, right? So let's put in, so say that in this case, I have a, polygonal uh, poly uh, a polygon, and I have two paths inside the polygon, F and D. And instead of computing the distance between them, the Euclidean distance between the, the, the uh, two entities when they move, I'm going to just decide if they can see each other. So that's it. Right, so now for every point on F and G, I just decide, can I see it or not? Can I see it or not? Can I see it or not? Right, it's just a yes or no question. So if it's yes, I color it white. If it's no, I color it gray. And now I decide if there is a point, if there is a path from the bottom left corner to the top right corner, which means that the two entities can move along F and G and at the whole time see each other. Right? So this corresponds to this. If they can see each other, it's white and otherwise. So can the owner and the dog walk along P and Q such they always see each other? So what's the obvious uh, answer in this case? Yes. Because I can go from here to here uh, uh, in the white space. Right. So actually in this case, it's, it's easy to see if they just go... Uh, more or less like this, uh, then, then they'll see each other the whole, whole time. Okay. So let's look at the, a different example. Uh, say I say that the entities must walk with, it with similar speed. Right? Okay, so now I actually assume that these, uh, that I scale these so they are equivalent to the length of the edges. But let's, let's ig ignore that for now. Okay. So now, again, I want to decide if I, if I can see to it that these two entities walk along the path and uh, they will always walk roughly at the same speed. Okay. Can the entities walk along P and Q with similar speed while keeping a distance of at most R? Well, so now 
uh, you do it a little bit differently because now you put the restriction on the path you want to find. So we want to find a path between P and, uh, the bottom left point and the top right point. But now I'm saying when I do this matching, I'm not allowed to get one point to go much faster than the other. So I will have a restriction on the angle of my path. So I can go to these points, I can go to these points, I can go to these points. So you see, from this point, I cannot go here. Right? I have to go with some similar speed to the other guy. So I have to go here. And then I'm stuck. Oops. Right? Because I cannot get here if I want them to use similar speed. So in this case, it's no. Uh, so again, you can just use this constraint-free space for a lot of different uh, measurements. Okay? Okay, let's uh, stop there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? So maybe we just finish with an, uh, an open problem. I mean, the, op the obvious open problem is can you have an epsilon simplification? Can you find an epsilon simplification? Uh, so that the complexity of P prime is bounded by uh, the complexity of uh, an optimal simplification using epsilon. Right? So, okay, some constant factor here. Right, we can only bound it with respect to the epsilon divided by 2 simplification, which again could be much, much bigger. You mean in subquadratic time? Uh, yes, yes, in subquadratic time. And for which distance Say you want to do it in order n log n. Yeah, so, well, preferably in the fresh air distance. Okay. Sorry? I think so too, yes. I think you're right. Sorry? Yeah, what I was talking about? Yeah. So I guess the question is what is the result? Oh, what the result is. Yeah, so they prove that so they prove that the complexity of the simplification is smaller than or equal to the complexity of the com uh, optimal simplification using a smaller error measure. So we know that uh, So Shin and Chan gave a quadratic time algorithm for this using the, but I guess, they use a yeah, yeah, but they use the Hausdorff distance. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And the other uh, obvious question may be, how you can take time into consideration. Because I, I, I went through it very fast and that's because I don't really like this statement. It's, I mean, the statement is very weak and how you can take time into consideration. So it would also be nice if you can prove some better properties. Right? Can you prove something stronger than what is stated in that paper? Okay.